Hello guys, David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. This episode number 66 of the Podaruni. I'm going to do a solo episode today. I'm going to answer some questions for you. Um, I will read those out now. One of them is how much do you use your learnings from PhDs in the industry to design what's in your programs? Uh, how useful is the thought process around strengthening the antagonist? This is a separate question. How useful is the thought process around strengthening the antagonist muscle to where you have pain, e.g., strengthening the core for lower back pain? Um, and then there's a two part question How long do you think you can keep making new content? And how long do you think it takes people, on average, to really get to grips with your system? Uh, so those are the questions I'll try and answer, depending on how long we go along. And uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be a good one. Hopefully it'll be a useful one for you. Um, Since I spoke to you last, we did a workshop in Tyrone in the north of Ireland up with Alice uh, at her lovely clinic there, a live physio. So thanks to Alice for hosting us. Absolutely beautiful venue. Great group of people, not our sold out workshop. So all our workshops have been sold out so far. So that's really exciting, humbling, cool to, to see that people are so keen to come. And that we're getting really good people at them, like top class groups of people Um, and a mix. And now some people are nervous, of course, like they feel like a couple of one of the girls I spoke to afterwards felt like she was going to be really out of her depth there. Um, I won't mention her name. And she was just delighted afterwards that she wasn't out of her depth because it was just because like she thought that it was going to be full of like just physios who are super intellectual and stuff like that and actually no she'd been following our work for a while and she was most people are on are pretty much on the same level they're they're just there to learn some people are better at one section and not as clear on another section of the workshop or like they're good at the foot stuff and not good at the hip stuff they're good at the plyos they're not good at the theory they're blah 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 everyone just has their strengths and weaknesses so we're just there to try and help fill those gaps and I of course have my strengths and weaknesses as well and I'm just trying to fill my gaps as much as I can as well so that's why uh that's why the workshops are fun we have one coming up in Dublin in May that's going to be our last Irish one for the year for 12 months at least so you should come along to that the early bird is still there and then we have Montreal coming up um the Vancouver one sold out before we even went live so thanks to Dave Leyland for that uh he promised us it would and it did so um that was a, a surprise to me so Vancouver is sold out Munich is sold out and London is sold out but we still have a few tickets for Dublin and Montreal in May and I think June as well so maybe you can jump into one of those um and then we we did a or I did a presentation in Perform X in London last weekend as well I, I spoke about present uh progressing your plyometrics it was a tricky it was hard to know like what topic to choose for that because I think where hopefully I can provide some value to people is having a little bit of nuance with with regards to with regards to just conversation, like having a just not even nuance, just like being able to dive into a bit of detail around things and come out actually think like most of the industry is like they're not thinking about things, they're just repeating something that someone else said. So I tried to be a critical thinker about things as much as I can. And hopefully we all do. Um, that's not a special skill. Hopefully we all do. Um, but it was tricky to know what to present on because there was obviously going to be a mix of, in, of people in the room at a presentation like that versus like, it was just an industry event versus at our workshop, obviously, like I can just present and go into as much detail as I feel like I need to. So I chose plyos because at least there's a vis- visual element to it and you can actually see these things happening in front of you. And um, it, sh- it intuitively starts to make sense when people start to see some of these movements. So that's what I chose. Unfortunately, our presentation was, it didn't work. Basically the videos, like we have, we have videos in our workshops and in our, in our presentations. So basically like the, the plyo presentation that I gave was about 30% of the plyometric section in the workshop. Um, yeah, I had to trim it down quite a bit, but it's still like bits from our workshop presentation and there are videos of my clients basically saying like, this was this guy and he progressed all the way through from this exercise to this exercise and given a given a logical progression and helping people understand why we did that and like, why are they moving the way they are and how we might want to change that and so on. So it's very visual. And of course, in, in the workshops, it's very 
practical then as well. We try and have as much practical as we can, but uh, the videos wouldn't work and the presentation wouldn't quite work for a lot of it. So uh, luckily Brent was there. Um, so shout out to Brent from Finding Function. He's a therapist in Sunderland, I believe. And um, he came up on stage and just we just went through everything together without really having too much presentation. Kira was backstage with the tech guys. Like she told me afterwards she was freaking out <laughs> trying to get it to work. And um, she did a good job. And we were just talk talking about it yesterday that like she was telling me, she actually told me she was freaking out a bit. And we were telling my dad about it and stuff. Uh, excuse me. And she said that she was quite proud of me for not freaking out while I was on stage. And honestly, I wasn't freaking out. It was, I, I had confidence that we could get through it. It wasn't as good as it could have been, of course, but I knew we could get through it. And also I just said to dad, like where, it was like, if I look back in six months time and this happened, what, what would I think about that? I would just think like, okay, it was embarrassing for a couple of hours. It, 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 we didn't like impress the people that were sitting there as much as we would have liked to, but did it affect my business? No, not really. Did it affect how I like my, my confidence in how I can actually present? No, not really. Did it affect my relationship with Kira or like with Brent for example or, or some of the people who are really there to see us um who who made sure that they came to our talk not really it shouldn't have so I wasn't going to freak out over that and I think we got through it and I think that is a nice lens to just look back and say like in a few months time will this really matter no okay well then you can be embarrassed in the moment but don't make it into something it's not so it went well it went okay in the end and um, hopefully people were there enjoyed it so with regards to our um, question, so how much, which one will we start with? How useful is the thought process around strengthening the antagonist muscle to where you have pain, e.g. strengthen your core for lower back pain? So, okay, so I think that that question is, another example I think of that question is, you have hip flexor pain or like tightness or something as well and you should strengthen your glute you have uh chest pain like not not heart or anything like ch tight chest and pecs and stuff you should just strengthen your back um that's the t common thought process and then the most common one would be like you have lower back pain or issues you should strengthen your core so it is a very common thought process in the industry and someone like Stuart McGill who I'm really not a big fan of um I know he's done some good work, but to be honest, it's it's so reductionist from someone who's quite intelligent. It's so reductionist. And so it's just outdated work, to be honest. And also the words he uses to describe people with issues are very much not what I would like to hear in terms of like, he just... He just basically tells people that they're fucked unless they do the stuff that he 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 likes. And the exercises are bullshit. They're just like three exercises that everyone is going to get. Everyone's going to get the same three exercises, the McGill big tree or whatever. They're bullshit. So anyway, sorry, I've gone off on a, a little bit of a sidetrack there. But that's where a lot of that thought process comes from. Uh, strengthen your core, stre uh, strengthen, strengthen like the front anterior core, strengthen the the sides of your body and basically keep your spine as stiff as you can. And that is what people are using. Um, strengthening the antagonist muscles where you have pain. I don't even know if that's the right description. It's just like strengthening, strengthening the core if you have lower back pain. So firstly with pain, I think anything can work. So that's the important thing to, to think about is that anything can work. So like that McGill stuff could work. Of course it could. It's just getting people to, it's a novel stimulus, it's getting people to work in a way that they don't usually work. And of course, that can actually help them with regards to their pain. So we have to just set aside the pain side of things and just think about like, okay, anything in theory really could help pain. I like to use that information thinking like, okay, anything actually could help pain, but I want to have things as predictable and repeatable as I can. When, when you talk about pain, Unfortunately, you can't be too predictable with it and you can't be too repeatable, but you can to an extent. Like you start to see people with lower back pain 
again and again. What can you predict for those types of people? You can predict that they will want to brace their core a lot. They would be very apprehensive with rounding their back or maybe extending their back or maybe side bending or maybe all of those movements. There'll be movements, there'll be a lot of apprehension there, there'll be a lot of bracing there. So we can be predictable in terms of we don't know why the pain dropped up in the first place. I have no idea why you're getting these issues. It could be a multitude of reasons, but we can be, we can predict relatively accurately that once you have it, here's how you will probably move. And that is with, with regard with a bracing strategy. And that goes for pretty much any joint in the body. You have knee pain. Are you going to want to be flexing and extending your knees through their full range of motion? Usually not that much. Usually you see people with knee pain walking down the stairs. They'll start to kind of walk sideways a little bit to avoid bending and, and putting load through that anterior knee. So, and I've been there myself. So we can be predictable in terms of how people can move, will will often move. Now we still need to look at the person that's in front of us, but we can be pre- quite, we can predict with relative accuracy how they will move when they come, come in with these issues. So that also means that we can, we can make predictable changes to how they move relatively easily as well, just by introducing some nice motion into the movements that they're avoiding in a pain-free range. And um, I also, in my mind, that also gives off or, or gives us relatively predictable results in terms of how people feel. So the thing that McGill might say or someone that like kind of subscribes to the thought process of, okay, you just need to strengthen the opposite muscle and brace even more is, well, our results are predictable as well. People start to feel a bit better as well. And I would, I would say, yes, uh, okay, that can, that can work pain wise, but actually what you're doing is robbing people of movement. So you're starting to fight tension with tension. And that's one of my key principles that I try to teach people when we're trying to help people relax. We're trying to restore relative motion when people have either lost motion um, by just not moving enough or by guarding or bracing too much. It doesn't doesn't matter that much. We're trying to restore relative motion and we're trying to help people move with more ease in their lives. Then I think a good principle and a solid principle that I teach, even though it's not necessarily applicable all of the time, is to not fight tension with tension. All right. So not brace an area, not say your back is super tight. You have pain. You're protecting that area. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to make your core super tight as well. I'm just going to layer on a ton more tension and get you to keep your core activated at all times. That's just layering on more tension. And even if that might help pain in the short term, it's robbing people of movement in the long term. So I think we can help pain in the short term by introducing motion to where people are missing it and help to help them. So that can help with pain and we can um, and we can keep their motion in the long term and actually improve how they move and improve pain rather than just trying to take a short term view to improving pain, but actually robbing them of movement elsewhere. So that's what I would say there. That's how I would look at the agonist versus antagonist to kind of strengthening the opposite muscle it goes the same with uh, people have a really tight chest and stuff like that um or 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 uh, anterior shoulder pain or something like that oh you're just going to strengthen the upper back we're just going to fight tension with tension we're just going to keep pinning our shoulder blades back yes it could work of course it could work to help with pain but ultimately you're going to rob people of movement and ultimately i we all know that that line motion is lotion and motion really is lotion. So I would rather give them more movement and help them reduce pain rather than take away movement and help them reduce pain. So I think that's my answer. And that comes back to like one of my five or six key principles, which is don't fight tension with tension or at least when you're trying to restore relative motion, or at least try not to fight tension with tension. It shouldn't be your first option. It should be to reduce overall tension, unnecessary tension in someone's body. So that's my answer for that. Um, hopefully helpful, a bit ranty or a bit all over the place. Uh, second one, how much do you use learnings from PhDs in the industry to design uh, your programs or design or on exercise selection or something? I think that might be a better way of putting it. Um, it's, it's, it's actually hard to answer. It's hard to know is actually the answer because 
many of what like a lot of people might think that they're not they don't read research let's say they might not read research and they might not ever have listened to a podcast with a phd in the industry a scientist in the industry a pain scientist uh uh um someone who is is amazing with acls or knee pain or achilles pain or hypertrophy or any of these really smart people in the industry so someone might say i've never listened to one of those i've never read research but they could be they could be influenced very much indirectly by these people so people that they've learned from might have learned from these people are people that they've it, it, it might go back a few layers deep. It might be like, okay, I've learned from this person who've learned from that person who's learned from that person who actually did read a lot of research back in the day or did listen to a lot of these people. And it just kind of the information filtered through, but not actually maybe where the source of that stuff came from in the first place. So I don't want to say, so there could be a lot of direct learning or indirect learning. And I've probably had a bit of both. Um, it's hard to measure. Or it's hard to say. I have a lot of respect for like PhDs in the industry, even though the pain world is murky. It's not great. I have to say with regards to research, it's definitely getting better. And then the injury world is a disaster, like in terms of sporting injuries and stuff like that, trying to measure, measure why hamstring injuries occur, why ACL injuries occur, why, why Achilles ruptures and stuff occur. It's such a, it's impossible to measure that stuff. It's it's just, it is simply impossible because there's so many variables because someone could have literally ate a food that didn't agree with them that morning and then they tore their ACL that evening. And how do you measure that? Like, and that sounds funny, but actually that could be not the sole, not the sole issue, but that could be have been the straw that broke the camel's back, for instance. So it's really hard to measure this stuff. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't listen to like PhDs and stuff like that. It's just that the job is such a tricky job that they're trying to do with regards to injuries, with regards to pain, it's getting a little bit better, definitely. Um, and then with regards to exercise science, like hypertrophy and stuff, I think that's probably a, a good bit further ahead because there's, because it's, it's, it's easier to measure. It's easier to measure. You can get a control group of people and, give them different stimuluses and, and you'll start to see different results. It's easier to measure, even if it's still probably too uh, reductionist a lot of the time. So directly and indirectly, I've probably learned from people. I have a lot of respect for anyone who's gone down like a route in the industry where they keep going down a certain direction and they can stay the course for years and years and years. Like someone who is obsessed with tendons, for example, and they keep going down that direction and that route for years and years and years and years and years. And years. Um, with regards to my, let's say my patellar tendon, right? So where does my thought process for my old, for patellar tendinopathy come from? A lot of it comes from my own patellar tendinopathy, my own anecdotal experience with that. How did I how did I get to the stage where I started to feel a lot better with my knee? Uh, I went through a lot of shit. I went to a lot of PhDs, which didn't help me. Now, it's a lot better now than it was even 10 years ago, but I went to a lot of these people. It didn't help me. I ended up stumbling across like just doing long isometrics, long holes, particularly where the quads are going to be stressed quite a bit. Uh, mostly because it was part of like my movement training, uh, where you're doing things like horse stance and, um, different, uh, Chinese martial arts, Taoist holds and stuff like that, where you're holding in a position for a long time. And I started to feel my, ten my patellar tendon, my knee starting to feel much better as, as a result of that stuff. And I had no idea that it would. So at that stage, I had to start to look into why this was the case. And I started to come across, I, I came across like years and years and years ago, like uh, Dr. Ebony Rio and Dr. Jill Cook. And they started to, they were trying to explain at that stage, like what was going on. So that was a lot of research that I read back then, um, or not a lot that I read back then, but some that I read back then, which was trying to help me explain what was happening in my own body. Then there was also like, I think it was Ebony Rio that had some stuff around the metronome back then. So I was using like a metronome in my ears years and years and years ago. And 
or whenever her whenever that research came out so that was something that I hadn't figured out myself and I read and I, I used it and it didn't I didn't find it particularly helpful and I didn't find it particularly enjoyable using something like that to kind of try and stimulate the brain side of things as well um but I have a massive I think rhythm is is really important so I think having some kind of rhythm in rehab is important and maybe some of my thought process is going back to that metronome type of type of idea may like this is what I'm trying to say maybe it's indirectly some of my the value that I place on rhythm and coordination goes back to listening or reading that like a metronome might be helpful for for people when they're exercising or what they're trying to do like isometrics for example for tendon issues so maybe it is now it's probably come from a lot of other places as well but maybe some of it is that so it's tricky for me to say with regards to like with regards to to researchers there's a few things i should say um so I've had Dr. Peter Maliaris on the podcast, who I think is brilliant. And, and like, I love talking to these people because they're, again, they've given, dive, dive deep into a certain area um, for a long time. And obviously they're, they are way more knowledgeable on certain things than me. And I've had Colin Griffin, who, if he's not a PhD, he's about to be. Um, I'd like to have Jill Cook. I'd like to have Ebony Rio, all these people. Um, so I'd like to have loads of, of these people on. But what I would say is my experience with uh, uh, not necessarily those people, but other researchers in the industry is they don't work with um, a particularly athletic population a lot of the time. And that's fine. I know people who listen to this podcast don't. And, I, and some of the people that I, I work with aren't particularly at, at athletic. But when you look at something like my foot and Achilles program, there's no studies to back up most of what's in there. Now, there is broadly in terms of we know that strengthening an area is going to, it does a good chance things are going to feel a bit better when we start to strengthen an area. And everything we do, like we're strengthening the area all of the time. Um, we're, we're introducing movement, blah, blah, blah. We're trying to manage our load. We're trying to just do the right amount, all that stuff. So like the research broadly backs that up, but it's not going to back up each of the individual exercises. So that's what I often get asked is like, is the research there to back up this exercise? I'm like, no, but like, why do you need it to back up that exercise? The research is just there to tell us if we strengthen this area in a progressive way, then it's probably going to be helpful. So that's how I look at it in that way. But I saw, uh, I saw, uh, so I, I think a lot of these research aren't, researchers aren't working with particularly po uh, athletic population. So for example, for an Achilles rehab, Achilles tendinopathy, right? Someone comes in with Achilles tendinopathy. A lot of the people that I get are athletic in, they're not necessarily like, I can, I'm a professional athlete, but they are pretty athletic. They train a few days a week to between a few days a week to like every day, whether it's running or playing tennis or basketball or whatever, or in the gym, they're trying to get stronger. They're trying to feel better. They're trying to move better, trying to get rid of this pain. So a lot of the professional athletes, let's say that I've worked with with Achilles tendinopathy have been doing calf raises for years and it's not helping them. It's helping them to a certain point. It's not getting rid of their Achilles tendinopathy. So when you look at a lot of these researchers that are talking about the importance of calf raises, and don't get me wrong, they're in my program as well, so that they are important. Don't get me wrong on this. But when you look at the, the population that they work with, a lot of the people that come into their clinic cannot do one calf raise, a single leg calf raise with a control tempo all the way up to the top and all the way back down. They can't do it. So, of course, getting that person from being able to do one, two or three calf raises up to doing 10 or 20 single leg calf raises is going to be a massive difference for them. It's probably going to help their Achilles a lot. It's going to help. It's going to have a big Im impact on their quality of life. Of course, it is because they're so weak in the first place. It's the same with like people who do glute clams for all their rehab. Of course, a glute clam might be helpful for an 80 year old person who can hardly even stand on a single leg. Of course, putting some load through their body is going to be helpful. But if you're working with anyone who is in any way like active, then that stuff is just not good enough anymore. So that's what I mean with like some of the researchers 
you can take the theory from what they're saying and appreciate that these people are way smarter than me, but you still have to look and say what actually works in clinic with me. And if someone is doing calf raises for the last two years and it's not getting better and they're doing all the right things in their calf raise, then at some stage, I have to say the research that these people are putting out doesn't necessarily apply to this person because adding two kilos when they can already, uh, a calf raise x amount of their body weight adding another two kilos to their calf raise or getting to do 12 instead of 10 is that going to be helpful probably not okay so i i'm i'm skeptical sometimes of the, the population that they work with and who they're actually studying because i just don't see this stuff working as well with professional athletes and and that's who i would like to and, and very active people and that's who i would like to see people being see these people being studied a bit more um, now that's again, that's not to say that the like some of the older population are uh, very, very weak or detrained people. That that th th those people are excellent to study, so we know that what might work with those people, but they're not a massive part of who I actually work with. I like working with people who are active. So, for example, um uh a, a physio the other day who has an education company shared a post uh saying of of a of a PhD who was talking about um it, it it was Jill Cook and she 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 was talking about uh it was a clip from her like her one of her courses or something like that and your man goes absolute clinical gold from Jill Cook here uh clinic uh, a clinical pearl absolute gold from Jill Cook and what was the absolute gold it was her saying make sure you get to the top of a calf raise and don't just drop from that top position make sure you control it up and down and this is a like, I know it's just a clip from a from a video from a, a longer a longer uh, course, let's say, and you can't judge anything just by a clip. But to say that that is clinical gold is just a joke because a personal trainer who's been in the industry for ten minutes can tell you that. Look at someone doing a calf raise or any exercise, and if they're not controlling it through a range then just control it through the range. That isn't hard to say or hard to do or hard to see. And if that's the level of clinical gold that we're looking at, then the industry is in serious trouble, I think. So that is not clinical gold or a clinical pearl. That is, when I was 16, when I was doing a bicep curl, I knew that. Just from doing 10 minutes of bicep curls, I was like, oh, I actually feel my muscle more if I just control it through the range. So that should be the most obvious thing in the world. And if that's what we're considering clinical goal, then like, come on, we need to do a bit better, I think. So uh, just getting to the top of a calf raise, can you get there? And then can you control it back down? Like, come on, like that is, if physios are getting trained for four years and then they're in practice for 10 years, and this is what they're trying to learn, then what have you been doing for the last 14 years that you didn't know that already? And you consider that clinical gold. So uh, how much do you use your learnings from PhDs in the industry? I try to learn from the smartest people I can. Um, and if if that includes, and that does include really smart people who are way, way, way smarter than me, who I'm happy to talk to, I'm happy to listen to, I, I'm super appreciative of these smart people who have gone way deeper on topics that I couldn't, I'm not intelligent enough to, and I don't have the drive to. So I'm super appreciative of them. But if you just base what you're trying to do based on what you hear from a couple of PhDs, then you're, you're, you're going to struggle, I think, in terms of your enjoyment and you're going to struggle in terms of if you're trying to work with athletic people or yeah, active people, then you have to realize that a lot of these people are not working with active people. They're working with people who are completely detrained. Um, not all. It's important to say not all. all. Again, I'm going because some someone will will think I'm trying to slate them. It's the it's actually the opposite. I think we should learn as much as we can from these people because they're actually the people who are trying to figure out what's going on. And I appreciate that. So I think that's my answer. Um there's probably some direct and then probably a lot of indirect learnings that have gone into it. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. Two part question. Um, how long do you think you can keep making new content for? Uh, I think forever I could keep making new content because I'm not really like making new content. I think I'm making, I'm just posting what I think about on a daily basis. And if I, so the day that I like stop thinking about movement and stuff like that, then is probably the day that I could stop 
uh, making content. The different question is how long do you want to keep making new content? I don't know if I want to do that forever where you're trying to be like posting on Instagram. If I'm 50 years old and I'm still posting stuff on Instagram or whatever the social media platform is, then, then like, Firstly, I'm definitely not cool anymore. I'm probably not cool now to a lot of people anyway. Um, but like, you're just like old man, whatever fucking DGR is still banging on about the same shit here. So um, you're probably not cool anymore. And I'm probably past the point where I really want to be doing that. Um, maybe I am, maybe I'm not at that stage. So I think you could keep making new content forever. Mostly like the content. I also don't want you to think like that, no, not, not that I don't want you to think the content that I'm posting isn't new to me. It's new content that I'm making, but it's not new content to me. It's new. It's, it's shit that's been in my brain for anywhere between 10 minutes and 10 years. So, um, it's not actually not 10 minutes. It's never been 10 minutes. Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant with what I post. I want to have that idea that's been like it could have came to me 10 minutes ago. Okay, this is how I'm going to explain it. But it's certainly anything you see me post has been like, I've been using it with clients for probably like a long time before that. So I think I can make new content for as long as I want to. And I think that goes for anyone. It's just, if you're thinking about something, you can talk about it and post it. So simple as that really. Um, but whether you want to keep doing it is a different question. And then how long do you think it takes people to get really get to grips with your system? Um, I'm still trying to get to grips with my system 10 years later. So, um, so yeah, uh, I think it depends. I'll give you a couple of anecdotes. So let me just open my phone. So I got a message from Joe uh, Mendez. I'll give Joe a shout out. Um, who sent me a message. She sent me a couple of screenshots um, from clients that were working with him um, and just saying how much one, he helped with their patellar tendinopathy and two, uh, hamstring tendinopathy. And he was just saying, uh, this is sponsored by DGR Education and the basics programs. Thanks so much, David. And uh, I just said like, look, you're, you've been following the work uh, for years now. So not many people are willing to keep learning for that long. So it's a testament to your persistence. And basically like you did the work, not me. So they're your clients, not mine. So that's what's important. But um, the, the thing that I wanted to read out was he, he said, first contact with your stuff actually, or sorry, first contact with your stuff was actually on Jake Tura's podcast in 2020. I didn't un understand a single word of what you said, but just thought there's something to this stuff and I've never looked back. So that's like three years ago. And he's, I said, he, like, you're still going strong. So hopefully many more years to come. So Joe in that three years has pretty much bought or has bought all of our programs, has done the DJ interactive work and He's probably at a stage now. I said to keep, I, I read this out to Kira because I thought like that was cool to see someone that's been learning from us, not intensely, but like consistently for three years or so. And he started from a place where he said, What did he say? Didn't understand a single word of what you said. So he started from a place where he, he didn't know what we were talking about, basically. And now he's probably at a place where he's at a, at a, at a very good level now, I would say. And we've never met. So that's that's three years for someone like that. But on along the way of those three years, I was just releasing my thought process along the way. So it's not like he had access to all of this stuff three years ago. He probably bought the programs as they went along. Then he's been watching HDGR interactive video as it was released. So that's three years in that in that regards. But if there was someone now who was more interested, and I, I, this isn't a sales pitch to say, like, obviously, if you want to learn this stuff, that's what you should be doing. But um, obviously, now there's more information out there. So it shouldn't take someone three years who's really hungry to learn it to, to get to that stage. But I, I even said to Kira, like, I, I still haven't even met you. We haven't even gone into, like, all the details that we would go into in a workshop and then even the people that come to the workshops who are at a really good level. Now I'm really happy with where people are at coming to our workshops. That's the reason I wasn't teaching these three years ago, really, because how do you, how do you even start? I would have to, I would have to teach a workshop before I release lower body basics and all that stuff. I would have to have taught a workshop on all the content in lower body basics. I would have to, 
spent a weekend teaching that content because people wouldn't have known it. But now they know that. They know the other content that we're talking about. They know the DJ interactive stuff. So now they can come to a workshop and we can actually get more into the details of things and, and talk about all the stuff that isn't in them programs. So um, so I just said, like, Joe, he's, he's at Takira. Like, he's at a good level now. He's getting really good results with his clients. And we actually still haven't even gone as deep or anywhere near as deep as we need to with these types of people because we're we're... Not that we're saving it, but we're just still getting there. So that was three years, for example. Then there's another anecdote, which was after the workshop with Alice. Uh, Alice has been working with us, has been uh, a physio that's doing, looking after a lot of our online clients for the last 18 months now. So after after our workshop in Alice's place on the Monday morning, we, taught, we saw three clients together. So um, one client... Yeah, two two of them were mine, and one of them were her was hers. Um, and they came, they came all kind of drove from around or whatever, and came in, and we saw them together. So, um, Alice has been with us for eighteen months now. She came in as a, like a good physio, so I knew she was good. Obviously, that's why I hired her, and I knew she had a ton of potential. Obviously, that's why we took her on. So, that was that was eighteen months, and we we did all three of those clients together. That's I walked away from that set those three sessions and I was we we're kind of driving home back down the road and I thought I'm really happy with where our like quote unquote system is at because each of those clients, Alice and I were going to assess in the same way. And I don't want her to be me. I like I don't mean that. I don't want anyone to be me. They have to be themselves and use what works well for them. But we were assessing them in the same way we were then coming to the same conclusions based on the assessment. We were pretty much come to the same conclusions that these are the things that they need to work on. And then when we reassess them, they get their changes that we had expected that we had predicted that they would get. And it's repeatable again, and again, and again, and again, based on this is what we're seeing in the assessment. This is what we will use as a result of that. This is where they're going to struggle to do that exercise. This is where we make the exercise better. This is the cues that we not the cues, actually, I leave people cue their own way, but like, I don't mind what cues you use, but this is the result that you need to see. And then this is the result that we saw. One of those, one of those uh, athletes is one of the most recognizable athletes in Ireland at the moment, one of the top footballers in Ireland at the moment, uh, easily. And like, he got, he got probably 25 degrees of internal rotation at his right hip that he's been working on for five years and hasn't got that. And he got that in like 25 minutes. He got 25 degrees in 25 minutes based on one exercise and based on it being co- oh no, two exercises based on them just being coached really well. And Alice and I would have agreed on those exercises. We probably, if we ta- if we tra- treated this person in two separate rooms, we probably would have done the exact same stuff. And not only that, we probably would have assessed in the same way and decided what we would have like decided. These are the things that we need to do. This is how we'll do them. And this is the result. We probably would have got the same results. So that to me is like Alice had, had Alice has had 18 months to get to that stage where now I'm really thinking she knows what we need to do. There's still more for her to learn and there's still more for me to learn. And we're always going to try and keep getting better. But it, it was the first time where I drove home and I was like, not, not confident with Alice. I've been confident all the way through or I wouldn't have had her uh, with us, but confident in like our system and thinking like this is predictable and repeatable again and again and again. And there's people all over the world who are using this stuff and getting predictable, repeatable results. You'll hear me say that again and again and again. You can get rid of pain with anyone doing any kind of a thing. We want predictable, repeatable results, uh, not just in pain, but in movement and in performance as well. So that's what I'm after. And that was 18 months for Alice. And that could have been accelerated much quicker um, if I was a better mentor to her, where I we were meeting more often, way more often, and I was more intense with her learnings, but I just quite didn't quite have the time. So I would say it took Alice probably 18 months to get to a stage where like I'm like, you know the system. Yeah, there's still more to learn for both of us, but like you are you are there hundred percent. You are you are there, you are going to be getting better results than 99.9% of the industry. Easy. And I'm very confident to say that. So so that was 18 months. Hopefully we can make that shorter again with something like the mentorship or something like that. That's going to come up where it's like eight weeks or 10 weeks or whatever, where 
in eight weeks or 10 weeks, if people come in at a decent level where they need to be coming in at, then we can accelerate that 18 months into like eight or 10 weeks. So that's how long I think that people it should take to get to grips with the quote unquote system, even though I don't like that word that much. So I guess for Joe, like he took a different route where it was, he was getting things all along the way as they were released. And three years later, I bet you he feels the same where he feels like I'm at a really good stage here. I actually really get this stuff and I'm able to get predictable, repeatable results. Alice, it was more like 18 months because I was mentoring her, but not nearly as intense as it could have or should have been just because of time issues. And uh, hopefully then other people that come to the workshop it's like a weekend that accelerates them quite a bit but hopefully then with a a more intensive like eight or ten or twelve week mentorship or something like that it will basically take the the three years of learning and turn it into 10 weeks or something like that so that's how long i think um but i just want to hopefully i just i just think that we're at a stage where the system is uh, are the principles are rock solid and I'm happy to present them to anyone in the world, the smartest people, the people working in the highest level of the industry. And I can stand over it and say, this is what I think, please try and tear it apart. And I will, and maybe they can tear it apart. Absolutely. Maybe they can, but I'm confident for them to try to do that. Um, and we've already done that because at Alice's place, there was, um there was someone from the nfl flew in there was someone from red bull uh performance in austria that flew in at all of our workshops at all of our all of our programs have been used all over the world in the top of the industry by the smartest people and they would be torn apart if and maybe they are maybe they are maybe i don't know it but i'm i'm just want to say i'm happy with where our system is at and how long do you think it takes people to get there it's up to them really i think it's it really depends it really depends but we're going to try and make it uh shorter and shorter and also it's important to note that like our system isn't finished it's it's still developing it's still hopefully getting better all of the time and i still have a lot of things that i want to share with people i don't want to say share with the world because that sounds like a fucking stupid dickhead thing to say just to share with people who are interested to learn. I have a lot of things that I haven't spoken about uh, outrightly that much yet. And a lot of details that we need to get into. So that's the, that's the answer there. Um, one talk I wanted to mention that I went to at perform X was Barry Hearn. Mar- Barry was, or is, was mostly one of the like best boxing promoters in the world um, or sports promoters in the world. His son, Eddie Hearn, now you might know from, he's representing Anthony Joshua and P- and people like that, Katie Taylor. Um, so Barry is like a self-made millionaire. Really, I, I, I really enjoyed his talk. He sat down with Gabby Logan, who's an absolute pro, and she kind of interviewed him. And he was so raw on the stage where he was just like, this is me, fuck you. He literally was like putting up his finger into the crowd and stuff like that. But just a couple of things that I, I I noted down in terms of how he told stories was one, he added in what might be seen, might might look like unnecessary details, but they were the things that made the stories. And I've been thinking about a bit, a bit about this. So he was telling a story around trying to organize his first big fight. And he was saying he was in a Chinese with his wife on a Sunday evening or something like that. And he was saying, I want to do this fight. I want to get this guy over from Australia, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, you're all fucking talk. Why don't you just do it? So he was telling the story. And, but the details that he added in were like, we were in a Chinese. It was a Sunday evening. It was, and he he said, and it was a bloody nice Chinese at that. So like none of that stuff is relevant to the story necessarily, but he added them. He added in details like that. And I was just like, this is a, a pro at at getting the crowd hooked, and it just it just it's hard to explain, but it just added to the experience. Uh, another one was like where so that was like it was a it was a really nice Chinese at that. Uh, another one was like he was oh Christmas Eve. I was walking to th- this meeting. If 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 it didn't work, then like we were going to go out of business. I had my briefcase in my hand. It was snowing. He was adding all these details. And I've, I've kind of, my point is 
I think I think it really worked, and I've actually started to go towards slightly longer form content on Instagram now. I'm starting to think about like. If you look at my reels that I was doing when I started doing reels, I was trying to copy everyone else where I was like talking really fast and and switching the camera as quickly as I could and all this stuff. Uh, oh, every two seconds, there has to be a change of angle and I need to be in a new place and I need to be speaking really fast. And actually, I think the opposite now. I've seen people, I was on James Smith's podcast the other day who like in terms of obviously content creation is one of the best there is in the industry. And I see people like him talking really slowly now and adding in little details and just, yeah, just slowing down. So I think I've seen things change from how much information can I get in this 10 second clip to how long actually can I keep people's attention for? How much longer can I keep them for? And that's something I think, I noticed with Barry and obviously it's different to doing that on, on social media, but like that was something that was evident to me, just how comfortable he was. And when you have the right crowd, you can actually slow down and start to say things. And that's where we're, we're going to be moving with our content. Cause I know some people at least are interested in like our content strategy and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm more interested now in, I'm going to just try that for a while, slowing down. And if you can get people's attention while slowing down rather than trying to be really fast, then you will build a better relationship with them much quicker and they'll buy more stuff, I think. So um, the other thing I learned from, or not learned, but the other really good thing with Barry was he told a story around a, gar a girl asked because he was like, he was, he, he, he's so like happy and he's so like, we can do this, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're we're going to be good, like we're going to be fine. I, I know I'm going to be good, blah, blah, blah. And girl asked, like, did you ever feel like you were going to struggle and something or something like that? And he just told a story anyway, blah, blah, blah. But in the end of it, he just said, like, I pulled that one out of the bag. I, I figured that one out. And when I figured that one out, I knew that, like, we can't be beaten. Uh, we just cannot be beaten. No matter what we try and do, we are going to be successful. Um, or not, 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 we're going to be successful, but like, even if it went to shit, we're fine. We're going to be okay. And I have complete confidence in my ability to figure it out. And I just thought like, that's such a, that's such a good attitude to have. And most people are doing the opposite. They're, they're always thinking of like, shit is going to go wrong. And like, what's the worst case scenario and all that stuff. And I thought, I thought I really took from him, like what's, what could go right here? What's the best case scenario? He was a, before he went into the boxing from our sports promotion, he was a, he was a chartered accountant and he actually got to a really good level of char in chartered accountancy uh, really early in his career. And he left and he was like, I'm going to do this. And he said, if it fucking doesn't work, I can just go back to being a chartered accountant. Whereas other people would look at that as like, Oh, if this doesn't work, if I went and did that, I've just lost all the ground that I've made and it's been a waste of time. He was just like, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try and make it work. If it doesn't work, who cares? I'll just go back to where I needed to, where, where I was in the first place anyway, or, or slightly lower down and work back up again. So yeah, I just liked, I just liked his thought process around like, just fucking try it and, and think about the upside rather than the downside. That's what that's what angel investors and all that stuff they that's what they do they're buying they're buying stocks in all these companies are are investing in all these companies if you invest a thousand euro into a company or a thousand dollars into a company or a million dollars you can lose the million dollars but the upside like the downside is limited you can only lose the million dollars but if you invest in something like facebook that's early on yeah you can lose your million or you can make unlimited amount of upside you can make a hundred billion from that investment there is no doubt there is no limit to the amount of of um of upside that comes from it so i think that was kind of helped me with our presentation where it wasn't going so well the presentation went fine but just the the presentation itself the the slideshow and stuff wasn't going well and it helped me to frame it afterwards like what was the downside here it wasn't that much like, okay, one hour of embarrassment if it went terribly versus the upside. Maybe people, some people could leave if we actually nailed it, thinking that was the best talk we ever had and we got all this exposure and blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I just think I'm trying to focus more on what's the upside 
usually it's unlimited versus the downside. For example, if you're trying to start to grow on social media and you're thinking, oh my God, some people are embarrassed or, or some people are going to be laughing at me and stuff like that. Yeah, the downside is people might laugh at you, but they're not people you care about. But the upside is you have no idea where this could end up. You have no idea releasing a product or opening a new place or uh, starting to just work on the thing that you really want to work on. There's unlimited upside from something like that versus very limited downside. Yeah, you're embarrassed. You end up deleting your account. A few people laugh at you. Who gives a shit? So, um, so yeah, I hope that was helpful for podcast wise. Please, maybe you can give it a share if you enjoyed it. And um, apart from that, I think that's the pod. And I will chat to you guys next week. Take care.